What's up guys, I'm Ira Rochelle and this is Nuggets of Truth. In today's world, the role of a mother is getting harder and harder to define. In fact, it's almost demeaning to want to be a mother unless you were born a biological male, which should make everyone stop and think, what in the world is happening? But I, I digress. During my research of what the role of a mother is, I found a few key traits that I believe each and every mother should try to embody. The first is probably the foundation of all the other traits. A mother runs the household. Now, I know what you may be thinking. A man is the head of the household. Well, I'm sorry to break it to you all, but that's actually nowhere in scripture. The verses that you're referring to are 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3 and Ephesians 5 23. In both of these verses, Paul states that the husband is the head of the wife. He doesn't even mention the household. So what does this mean? The wife holds up the household, but the husband holds up the wife. So how did we come to this conclusion? Well, let's start with the most famous chapter when it comes to women, Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31 verse 16. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. With whose money is she considering a field? The household's money. And does it say that she consults her husband and asks him for permission? No. It says that she considers the field and she buys it. Then she plants a vineyard. Who do you think will benefit from this? Her entire household. She's expanding their estate and their wealth but here's the key, she uses discernment. This word here, translated as considers, is the Hebrew word on the screen, which means to plan, plot, intend, to think with the purpose of planning or deciding a course of action. I want you to notice that she didn't just go out, see a piece of land, think it was pretty, and then buy it. No, she looked at it and discerned whether or not she could use it, whether or not it could benefit her family. Then she came up with a plan on how it could be used. This is something all mothers should strive towards, having, using, and growing a spirit of discernment in order to better serve her family. Our next verse is found in one of my favorite stories, and we'll be referring to it a few more times in this video. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 18-17 through 17. One day Elisha went to Shunem, where a wealthy woman lived, who urged him to eat some food. So whenever he passed that way, he would turn in there to eat food. And she said to her husband, Behold now, I know that this is a holy man of God who is continually passing our way. Let us make a small room on the roof with walls and put there for him a bed, a table, and a chair, and a lamp, so that whenever he comes to us, he can go in there. One day he came there and he turned into the chamber and rested there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite. When he had called her, she stood before him. And he said to him, say now to her, see, you have taken all this trouble for us. What is to be done for you? Would you have a spoken word on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? She answered, I dwell among my own people. And he said, what then is to be done for her? Gehazi answered, Well, she has no son, and her husband is old. He said, Call her. And when he called her, she stood in the doorway. And he said, At this season, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, No, my lord, O man of God, do not lie to your servant. But the woman conceived, and she bore a son about that time the following spring, as Elisha had said to her. Did you catch that? It was the woman who said to Elisha, come eat at our home. It was the woman who said to her husband, make a room for him in our home. You know what isn't said in this story at any point in time? Any kind of correction for this woman taking charge of her household. Never once does that happen. In fact, because of what she did, God rewarded her through his prophet Elisha. He gave her a son because she embodied the traits of a mother and put them into action. She had the discernment that Elisha was a man of God and then went to her husband so that he might make a room for Elisha. She didn't ask him for permission. No, she told him, hey, this will be best for our family. 
And he was like, yeah, sure. Whatever you think, baby. I'll make it happen. And he did it. He did as she said. And they were both rewarded for this. Now, because a mother runs the household, she has to also be a caretaker of said household. After the Shunammite woman gave birth to her son and he grew up, he hurt his head. Now look at what the father's response is. 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 18 through 21. When the child had grown, he went out one day to his father among the reapers. And he said to his father, Oh, my head, my head. The father said to his servant, Carry him to his mother. And when he had lifted him and brought him to his mother, the child sat on her lap till noon. And then he died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door behind him and went out. Did you notice how the father didn't stop working? Instead, he sent the boy to his mother. There's a reason why when we are sick or in pain or hurt that we want our mothers. They are the caretakers of the household. The mother held her son in her lap, comforting him. When he died, she had a plan because she had discernment. But before I get too far ahead of myself, let's read our next verse and get back to our perfect woman chapter. Proverbs chapter 31 verse 15. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. A mother puts the needs of the household above her own needs. She makes sure her household has what it needs in order to run smoothly. She'll sacrifice whatever is necessary in order to make sure that she takes care of her family, including sacrificing sleep. Now, one of my favorite songs as a kid was The Christmas Shoes by New Song. I think it depicts a mother perfectly when the little boy says, Mama made Christmas good in our house, though most years she just did without. Mothers will do without so that their families can have and enjoy. The trait of a caretaker is so important for a mother to embody that God himself compares his caretaking, his comforting, to that of a mother in Isaiah chapter 66 verse 13. Now because a mother is a caretaker, she also has to be an intercessor. An intercessor is someone who goes on behalf of another. Let's get back to our story of the Shunammite woman. Her son has just died. She's laid him on the bed of the man of God. She went out and closed the door behind her. 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 22 through 37. Then she called to her husband and said, Send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys that I may quickly go to the man of God and come back again. And he said, Why will you go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. She said, All is well. Then she saddled the donkey and she said to her servant, Urge the animal on. Do not slacken those pace for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When the man of God saw her coming, he said to Gehazi his servant, Look, there is a Shunammite. Run at once to meet her and say to her, Is all well with you? Is all well with your husband? Is all well with the child? And she answered, All is well. And when she came to the mountain to the man of God, she caught hold of his feet. And Gehazi came to push her away. But the man of God said, Leave her alone, for she is in bitter distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Then she said, Did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? He said to Gehazi, Tie up your garment and take my staff in your hand and go. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not reply. And lay my staff on the face of the child. Then the mother of the child said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So he rose and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was no sound or sign of life. Therefore he returned to meet him and told him, This child has not awakened. When Elisha came into the house, he saw the child lying dead on his bed. So he went in and shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he went up and lay on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands. And as he stretched himself upon him, the flesh of the child became warm. Then he got up again and walked once back and forth in the house, and went up and stretched himself upon him. 
the child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. Then he summoned Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite. So he called her, and when she came to him, he said, Pick up your son. She came and fell at his feet, bowing to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. She was a mother on a mission. Her only son had just died, and she refused to let anyone know except for the man of God. This is important. As women, we low-key like to talk about our problems more than we should. We low-key enjoy complaining. Don't get me wrong. I'm right there in the boat with you. But that's not one of our strong points. That's not one of the stereotypes that we want to embody. When we're interceding on behalf of someone, especially our children, we should be careful not to go to a bunch of people that can allow doubt, fear, anger, or any other kind of negative feeling within us that can stop our prayers from being heard. We have to go straight to the one who can help us. And today, that's Jesus. If the burdens feel too heavy to hold on your own, have a small group of trusted intercessors that you know have the faith and prayer life that can help you stand in the gap and intercede with you. But let's not go to people in order to complain or lay our burdens on them. We are to cast our burdens on Jesus for he cares for us. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. We have to do what the Canaanite woman did when her daughter was oppressed by a demon during the ministry of Jesus. Matthew chapter 15, verse 21 through 28. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from the region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. The woman followed Jesus, begging and pleading with him, even though he didn't acknowledge her. She did this for so long that his disciples asked him to send her away. This didn't deter her though. It didn't discourage her either. She got in front of him and knelt down before him and begged. Jesus called her daughter a dog. Yet she didn't revile or become defensive. Instead, she humbled herself as low as she could go in order for her daughter to receive her healing. For more on why Jesus responded to this mother in this way, check out our video, The Little Dogs and the Syrophoenician Woman, which is under our Nuggets of Truth category. As intercessors, we have to keep asking, even if we feel like we're being ignored. We have to keep humbling ourselves, even if we feel like we've humbled ourselves as low as possible. We keep asking, not for our sake, but for the sake of our child. Now, in order to be a good intercessor, a mother also has to be a teacher. James tells us that faith without action is dead. James chapter 2, verse 14 through 20. Therefore, a mother must also teach exactly what she's praying for. If you're praying that your child will be a disciple of Christ, then teach your child how to follow Christ. Proverbs 22, verse 6. We see this very clearly in the book of Proverbs. Solomon, in all of his wisdom, urged us not to forsake our mother's teaching. Proverbs 1, verse 8. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching. He repeats the same thing in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20. Both times it's the mother's teaching, not the father's teaching. Instead, it's the father's commands or instruction. Whereas it's the mother's teaching that we must hold to and not forsake or abandon. This word translated here as teaching is the Hebrew word Torah, which means law, regulation, a legal prescription of something that should or must be done, teaching, instruction, information that is imparted to a student. And more times than not, that word Torah is translated as law. Solomon goes on to say that the commands are the lamp and the teachings the Torah are the light. Proverbs chapter 6 verse 23. 
For the command is a lamp, and the teaching a light, and the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. We see a familiar statement in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 21, verse 23. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. How do we see the light? How do we see the glory of God? Through Jesus, the Lamb, who is the lamp. This goes back to what we discussed earlier. The mother holds the household and the husband holds the wife. This is important to understand. We're not lowering the place of the father or the husband in the household. The father, the husband is irreplaceable in the household because he holds up the mother and the mother holds up the household. The father's commands are the basis and the foundation of the mother's teachings that guide the household. So it's not just the father who is to impart wisdom upon the child, but the mother as well. The mother is to make sure she teaches her children the laws of the Lord, the teachings of God, the way, the truth, and the life. Mothers must teach their children about Jesus. Proverbs 31, the perfect woman chapter, wasn't just some man's idea of what the perfect woman should be. Proverbs 31 was the teachings that King Lemuel learned from his mother. Proverbs 31 verse 1, the words of King Lemuel, an oracle that his mother taught him. A mother has to teach her children. Once a mother has taught her children, then she begins to guide them as they get older. A mother is a guide. Proverbs 31 verse 26, she opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Throughout the book of Ruth, Naomi guides Ruth. She tells her which field to remain in, Ruth 2, verse 17 through 23. She tells her how to request Boaz to redeem her, Ruth 3, 1 through 4. If Naomi didn't have wisdom and understanding, there's a very good chance that her daughter-in-law Ruth would have never been redeemed by Boaz. There's a very good chance that Naomi would have remained in depression, calling herself Mara, Ruth 1:20. Ruth would have never become the great grandmother of King David, Ruth 4, 13 through 17. She would have never become a direct ancestor of Jesus Christ himself, Matthew 1, 1 through 17. A mother must be filled with discernment, wisdom, understanding, and love in order to teach and guide her children in the ways of the Lord. The only way to achieve these things is to begin with the fear of the Lord, Proverbs 1, 7. So what is the fear of the Lord? Proverbs chapter 8 verse 13 says, The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride, and arrogance, and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. Mothers, we have a responsibility to raise up our children in the way they should go, to teach them the true love of the Lord, to teach them to hate evil, to love goodness, to seek the Lord, then we must guide them with the wisdom of the Lord. Therefore, we must first seek the Lord and have the fear of the Lord ourselves if we want to successfully teach and guide our children. Lastly, a mother passes down a legacy to her children. She passes down gifts, blessings, and an inheritance. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois and your mother Eunice and now I am sure dwells in you as well. The gift of faith was passed down from Lois to Eunice to Timothy. Who's to say if Timothy would have the faith he did if it weren't for his grandmother then his mother passing that gift from one generation to the next. Your gifts are passed down from generation to generation when you use them and stir them up. Your walk with the Lord is even passed down from you to your children, so that they are born under the covering of righteousness and holiness. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 13-14 through 14. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him, for the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are are holy. The gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, and the Spirit himself is not a respecter of persons. For we are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians chapter 3 verse 28. 
We each, both male and female, have been given spiritual fruit and gifts. What we do with them and how we grow them will directly affect our children regardless of whether we are male or female. Timothy's father was a Greek but his mother was a Jewish believer, Acts 16 verse 1. This means that his father was not a believer. Therefore, it was his mother's teaching, guidance, intercession, gifts, and fruit that molded Timothy into the man of God that he was. Mothers, your spiritual walk with God is just as important to the upbringing of your children as your husband's spiritual walk with God is. So with all of that said, let's sum everything up for you guys. There are many roles that a mother must play, but the most important is to run the household because everything else is rooted in that. From there, she becomes a caretaker, an intercessor, a teacher, a guide, and a passer down of a legacy. In order to successfully fulfill each and every one of these roles, a mother must have wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and discernment, which are all rooted in the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the hatred of evil. Therefore, we must be rooted in the love of the Lord in order to raise our children and keep our household in the love of the Lord as well. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and it cleared up a few things about what the role of a mother is. And if you did enjoy this video, please feel free to like, comment, share, and subscribe to our channel. And until next time, God bless.